Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome to a new and also the last video for this year on my channel. I'm happy that you're joined in again and today's video will be quite interesting. I think it's a video I wanted to do for almost two months now. Finally, I found the time to do so. And in today's video, we will mainly compare the Z270 to Z370 sockets in regard of the electrical capabilities. So moving from Z270 to Z370, Intel increased the pin count for V-Core and also for ground. They increased the V-Core count by 18 pins and increased the ground count by 14 pins. Previously on Z270 those pins were reserve pins and now they added them to V-Core and ground and that's the reason why Intel said the 9900K or 8700K are not downwards compatible to C270 because they changed the pinout of the CPU and also of the socket. In today's video we will analyze the socket, also some single pins to see if we can kind of overload pins and also the socket itself because from my point of view I'm not really sure if 14 or 18 pins changing will really do something because if we just look at this setup running here it's a C390 setup with 9900K currently running Prime95 in the background at 5 gigahertz 1.35 volt pulling about 200 watt from the CPU directly and if we just translate that we can calculate that with 200 watt and 1.35 volt we will have a current of 148 amps and on C390 that would be 1.01 amps and on C270 it would be 1.15 amps so it's roughly 15% more load on C390 on a single pin in the socket when it comes to V-Core. So of course the load is higher, but still from my point of view, I'm not sure if one amp is really a problem. If we take a look at stock, stock is a lot lower. So 95 watt with 1.1 uh, volt equals 86 amps. So it would only be 0.59 amps on C390 and it would be 0.67 amps on C270. I grabbed a broken board from our warehouse. It's a C370 EVGA board. The brand doesn't really matter here because I will mainly remove the socket from this main board. I will try to re remove it with the heat gun so we can access a single pin. So we can also take a closer look at the socket itself, see how the socket is built, like how are the pins fixed in the socket itself and what could be a potential issue. Because the theory is that if the current flowing through the socket, through the pins is too high, then it also equals a higher heat coming from the pin because if you have a high amount of current flowing through the pin, it will generate some heat inside the pin itself, which can then cause problems. It could melt the socket in theory if it would get hot enough. But I think the bigger problem is the contact directly between the pin and also the pad of the CPU. I think at a certain point we will see some burning marks on the CPU, but that's something we will find out in today's video. So the first thing I will do is remove the socket from the C390 board, uh, from the C370 board from EVGA and try to take off a single pin. Then I will attach this single pin to adjustable PSU I have here. It's not a normal PC PSU, it's a specific one where I can adjust the current flowing through the pin. And then we should be able to measure the temperature across the pin itself, which should give us some numbers because if we would see the pin reaches a temperature of 300 degrees Celsius or 400, then we would know it's too much for a plastic socket and could potentially cause some issues. But if we see that the pin hits, I don't know, like 70 degrees Celsius, 60 degrees Celsius, it's probably not an issue, but that's what we will find out in today's video. So first step, let's try to remove the socket.
So I successfully removed the socket from the EVGA board and I also cut the socket into pieces to remove some of the pins out of the socket and also to put a single piece of the socket underneath the microscope which you can see now. And you can see how beautiful those pins are aligned inside the socket and you cannot really see it now or cannot see it yet. I already analyzed it so we will now zoom into much more. This is currently 20 times magnified and we will now magnify it 100 times and then it will be much more interesting, I think. Now zoomed in 100 times, you can see the contact surface of the pins itself. So we have this small hook on the top, which is also gold plated for better contact and to prevent oxidation of the pin itself. And that's what we can see here, all the pins aligned. And if we focus now on the bottom part of the socket, of the plastic areas, you can see the pin is quite a bit more complex than you would assume. So we have an additional part of the pin inside here, which we cannot really see or analyze yet why this is there and what this really is. That's why I removed some of the single pins out of the socket so we can analyze that as well. We can also see some marks inside the socket. I'm pretty sure this is due to manufacturing of the mold. So probably the mold um, that puts together the plastic part and the pins themselves. I'm not 100% sure how they manufacture this. I would assume that they have some kind of tool that holds the pin in place and then they put the plastic around it. In injection molding that would be what I assume and those are typically marks of injection molding. Now you can see three pins under the microscope 20 times magnified so it's not that big yet but we can already straight see what the additional piece of metal in the socket was so that's actually this area here. So the pin itself is quite a bit more complex it's a folded piece of metal. We can see the hook on the bottom right here which is the contact surface to the CPU pad Then it goes inside the plastic socket. Everything that this is here is inside the plastic socket probably to hold the pin in place to give it some some sort of stability inside the socket. Then we have this very thin piece on the bottom which is probably the weakest point of the pin and also should be the spot that gets the hottest probably beside the contact surface directly to the pad and there we have the solder joint where the pad or the pin is connected directly to the PCB. So let's zoom in 90 times onto the pin. Now zoomed in 90 times it shows how small those pins are. So the top left corner that's the area where the pin is connected directly to the PCB then this very thin part that goes into the plastic part of the socket itself then the folded metal part where the hook comes out and the hook you can see on the bottom right I can try to focus more on the hook. Now the hook is focused and this is the part that actually touches the CPU on the bottom it's very very tiny. So the question is how much current can such a pin take before taking any sort of damage. So that's why I will change the setup here. I will put a special PSU on here. I will solder one of the pins between two thick wires so we can run some current through it. As you can see everything is set up on the table now so I have the PSU here the adjustable one where I can adjust the current and also the voltage on the fly and it has OCP also OVP so I can adjust everything I need. I attached two cables to it two quite thick ones so it's 2.5 square millimeter cables um, which can compensate quite a lot of heat obviously so the pin is attached between the two cables obviously as I said before the cables can compensate quite a lot of the heat they can take up quite a lot of it which kind of makes sense because the PCB of the mainboard would essentially do the same so this side the left side um, simulates the PCB right side simulates the CPU and what we can do now is that we adjust the current to 2 amps which is pretty much what we had maximum so far for or what I had maximum so far on the test which I'm doing live on the left side which we will come to in a bit. So you can hear the PSU kind of ramped up the fan for cooling a bit. So there's quite a lot of uh, load on the PSU now. I have a thermometer next to it with a thermocouple attached to it, which I can use now to touch the pin directly. And we can see the pin heats up a bit. So 
about 30 degrees Celsius to just about 5 degrees Celsius above room temperature, which is obviously not a lot. Obviously also because the cables, as I said before, can take up quite a lot of the heat. So what we will do now is we adjust the current to the maximum, which is 5 amps. So we have 5 amps flowing through the pins now, uh, through the pin now. And if we just touch the pin now, we can see that it's, it's really heating up now. So it's already 40, 50 degrees, something like this. So I will just keep this running for about half an hour or one hour until the cables heat up a little bit. So they have some time to compensate the heat. And then we will check back if something happened to the pin. So we just passed half an hour of testing and visually nothing really changed under the microscope. I couldn't see anything. And if we check the temperature of the pin itself, we can see it's, yeah, it heated up a bit, but not really that much. So we are at 52 degrees Celsius, maybe 53. It's not, I mean, it's far away from anything that could be a problem for the pin. It's a metal pin, so it should be capable of ha uh, handling several hundred degrees Celsius before it has any kind of problems. And also looking at the, the left side, which is kind of the weak spot, which we spotted earlier under the microscope. This spot is not directly in the solder, so it should be exposed and it should be the hottest part of the pin in theory or the part directly on the right side. And I cannot see any visual changes and I don't think that they would be quite a lot warmer than the pin in the middle. So I think running 5 amps across the pin should be fine from what we can test or see here now. So now that we know that the pin itself should not really be a problem, so it can handle 5 amps, no issue. And now we will tape some of the pins of this CPU, it's a 9900K, we will tape 18 pins of V-Core, so we will simulate C270 socket. Then I will keep running this setup overnight with Prime95, 100% load with small FFTs, so it's about 200 watt load, which equals about 1 amp running or 1.1 amp running through a pin. It's not really that much more than 1 amp, so I don't expect any issues, but we will keep this running overnight and tomorrow we will check back and see if anything happened. So the setup has been running overnight and as expected, no issues to the socket, also nothing happened to the CPU, which was kind of obvious because it's only 10% higher load per single pin. And if we just overclock the CPU 10% higher, we typically also don't see any issues. So that was kind of expected. So what we will do now is that we will keep taping those pins until something happens, I assume. And we will see how many we have to tape until something really happens. Almost one day later, a lot of testing later, and I have the CPU in my hand. It still looks fine. You can see a lot of the pins are taped meanwhile. So after taping 18 pins of the CPU, which was simulating C270, which was not an issue, I kept taping pins. So the first step I did was 28 pins, then 38, then 45, then 56, and then 69 pins out of 146. So that's quite a lot, and that's the progress I have on the CPU now. So 69 pins are taped. 69 pin, 69 pins have been running under Prime95 load with 200 watts pulling from the CPU. So that's 1.92 amps across a single pin, while stock is 0.59 amps. And with 200 watt load and stock pins, it would be 1.01 amps per pin. So it's almost double the current per pin with taping 69 pins has been running for six hours straight, no issues. The socket looks like brand new. CPU looks, apart from the fact that I taped some of the pins, looks perfectly fine. I couldn't see anything on a single pad. So that's quite surprising. Um, I expected to see something at, I don't know, like 40 or 50 pins, but so far nothing. So the socket can take a lot more, it seems, than what I expected. I will not uh, keep continue taping at this point because I think it doesn't really make much more sense, obviously, 
if we end up at, I don't know, two pins left, there will be issues for sure. But that's not really the point because originally we wanted to check if there is a valid reason why we would change the socket from C270 to C370 with the 9900K pulling more current than 8700K or 7700K. But it seems like there is not really a need to do that. The question is also how would it age over time? What would happen after two years? What would happen if you open and close the socket many more times because after a certain amount of socket closing, also mounting coolers with heavy pressure, we noticed that the contact between the pins and the pads are getting quite a lot worse. But that's also something you don't have in your daily rig because typically you mount your CPU once, you mount your cooler once, maybe you change it once, but then you only mounted it twice total. And on here, on this setup, I don't know how many times I mounted the CPU, at least 10 or 15 times now also with mounting pressure and no issue whatsoever. So very interesting that nothing happened and also very interesting that for sure it would not have been needed for the change from C270 to C370 to change the pin count or add ground and add V-core. For sure that was not necessary. So in theory, I think it would have been fine to run the 9900K also on C270 and it would also be compatible to C170 of course. But you have to keep in mind that C270, C170 boards are quite a lot worse when it comes to VRM and also VRM cooling because the manufacturers, they listened to our feedback and developed their boards much more. So yeah, I think it's kind of good that we have C390 boards now with proper VRM cooling that are suitable for the 9900K. But I think it would also make sense to have C270 and C170 boards compatible to 9900K for people who want to upgrade their CPU, don't want to overclock, but want to keep their main board. That's it for this video. I also want to thank you very, very much for the year 2018, for the continuous support in 2018. It has been an incredible year for me. So many things changed on the channel, also in my private life. So quite an interesting year for me and 2019 for sure will also be interesting again. It will start right away for me at CES. So in the first week of January, I will fly to Vegas. We'll meet some YouTubers there. We'll also meet a lot of manufacturers. I'm not sure if I will provide any kind of content on YouTube, but I will provide a lot of content on my Instagram channel because it's simply a lot easier if I just pass by a vendor's booth, have a quick chat. And if I spot an interesting product, I can just post some Instagram stories, tell you a bit about the product there. So maybe check out my Instagram channel down below. Enjoy the rest of the very short year 2018 and happy new year 2019. See you there. See you soon.